Hi, I'm Mara Goldstein. I'm a senior biotechnology analyst with Mizuho. I'm Ann Hines, senior healthcare service analyst at Mizuho, and I cover various subsectors of healthcare services. I'm Vikram Malhotra, one of Mizuho's VEAT analysts. I have covered uh, real estate for over 20 years. Uh, of keen focus to me recently has been some major themes, including life sciences, uh, which we're going to talk about today. So Mary, we recently published a couple of slide deck, Mizuho Collaborates, mm -hmm. focusing on life sciences, the evolution, as well as what it means for real estate, and then CROs. What's the state of play for life sciences today? So it's, it's certainly a challenging time. As you know, the biotechnology industry, life sciences broadly, uh, encompasses some larger companies, but the vast majority of the universe companies are smaller. They are pre-revenue companies, so they require uh, consistent funding. Um, historically, companies have been able to access capital markets. Obviously, there's the IPOs, but in addition to that, follow-on offerings, typically pegged to corporate development opportunities or clinical development opportunities, things like that. Um, we've seen that window go dry. And historically, biotech companies, and here we're talking about these, again, pre-revenue development stage companies, um, you know, typically have about four to six quarters of cash on hand. We're seeing companies return back to that four to six quarters of cash on hand, um, but that does raise the question and potentially red flag for some companies as to when they will be able to fundraise again. So in order to alleviate some of those concerns. Companies have been doing things like restructuring and reprioritizing pipelines. Some companies that are in weaker positions, we're seeing them merge with other companies of sort of similar vein in order to combine technologies and stretch out cash runway. Today, there are you know, five to 600 biotech companies on SMID cap size, uh, publicly traded, that are looking at any point in time to raise capital. On the other hand, restructuring does lengthen runway, and we've seen a number of companies, the restructuring activity um, and reprioritization activity has accelerated through the first quarter and into the second quarter of the year compared to last year. Well over 100 companies have um, either discontinued programs, restructured, entertained some layoffs and the like. But what you see out of that is that this runway, which we typically measure in quarters, has gone up considerably. So Vikram, I'm curious, you know, what you're hearing, how companies are approaching their access to having, you know, capital in the space that they're inhabiting and whether or not, you know, that is at risk today. No, that's a, it's, it's a fair question. I would say three things. You know, first of all, it's intriguing that year to date, and especially post SVB, the XPI and the CROs that Ann covers have uh, materially outperformed the lab read. So, if I focus just on the credit side, you know, we performed a deep dive on Alexandria and Peaks underlying tenancies, the two REITs we cover. Interestingly, we found the cash runways are materially better than the average that you've analyzed. Uh, you know, the what we say monitoring list is probably two to four percent of square footage for ARE, five to seven for Health Peak, uh, which I think is manageable, probably similar to last year. Uh, and it, certainly from an earnings standpoint, we think maybe there's risk of four to five percent as we think about this year versus next. But that tells me there's a lot in the price side. Uh, I think that, that risk is small and smaller than perceived and manageable. Mm -hmm. It's the supply side that we're working through. And I think Alexandra in particular is very well positioned to gain share. So if, for example, vacancy goes from six percent today to 10 percent, I don't think we see the same vacancy level in Alexandria's portfolio. I think we like the lab reads here. We see it as a lower beta way to play what is clearly a still very challenged and uh, evolving life sciences market. Interesting. I mean, I, I will add that we found that when companies do either combine or restructure, um, the space that they inhabit doesn't change dramatically, or it does over a period of time. No, that, that's definitely fascinating. I think it echoes with what we've heard from brokers. Um, companies are more focused on rationalizing the office component. Um, there's still a great need for lab space. Mm -hmm. and. You know, in this uh, day and age of a lot of thematic investing where life science and a lot of funds going towards new drug discoveries, certainly AI and the mm -hmm. talk of how that may accelerate drug discovery. You know, and um, it, it'll be interesting to get your perspective on the CROs. So CROs are clinical research organizations. They help big pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies perform clinical trials. And obviously the CROs are down, have been down the past couple of years just because they do have leverage to the funding environment. And the funding environment has been very strong over the past five years. So a big drop. But if you look at historically, that 60 billion is in line with historical ranges of 60 to 70 billion. That's more normalized levels. For the, so the, for the CROs, 
if funding ever got down to like the 30 or 40 billion range, that would probably pressure revenue growth going forward. But we're not seeing that as of today. Um, and I would note that the, the publicly traded CROs, that it still is um, a fragmented market. And the publicly traded CROs, despite the funding environment, have still been able to maintain a book to bill, which is an industry bogey of future revenue growth of 1.2 to 1.3 times. And if they can maintain that, that translates into high single digit revenue growth. Emerging biotech companies is probably only 15% of their backlog. And more speculative biotech companies are probably only 5% of their backlog. And they're really gaining market share with the large pharmaceutical companies, to be frank. So because companies like Icon and IQVIA and PPD, which is part of Thermo Fisher, they were they were the big three that did all the COVID clinical trials. And I think the trials really brought out these three companies' capabilities. So their revenue has been held um, up nicely, to be frank. And we're so bullish because the stocks are traded down so much and they're trading in line with the company's 10-year low average that the streets are already assuming that 2024 revenue estimates probably have to come down. Well, that's uh, that, that's definitely fascinating. And so, uh, you know, thanks for listening in uh, to our latest episode of Mizuho Collaborates. We truly are collaborating. Mara and myself are here in New York, Anne's in Boston. Uh, we have a fabulous slide deck, over 40 pages, talking about all the concepts that and the themes we just referenced. We, thanks again for listening.